Perhaps the most fundamental observation in Earth science is that sedimentary rocks often come in distinct layers that can be tens to hundreds of meters thick. Each layer is evidence of a distinct environment with distinct fossils formed over millions of years. Then in the blink of a geologic eye, the environment and fossils suddenly change. Now, geologists mapping these changes over time have come up with a geologic time scale and are gradually getting more and more precise about exactly when these changes happen. But what causes these sudden changes in environment? Today I want to summarize the evidence suggesting that the majority of these sudden changes are caused by sudden warming, even within years, and sometimes lasting tens of thousands of years. Now sudden warming, I'm going to show, is caused by basaltic lava flows covering hundreds to millions of square kilometers. The more extensive the flow, the greater the warming and the greater the sudden change. Slow incremental cooling, I'm going to show, is caused by several major explosive aerosol forming volcanic eruptions per century and having this go on for millennia. Basaltic eruptions are most voluminous in continental rift zones. Major explosive eruptions are most numerous in subduction zones. And it's this balance between rifting and subduction driven by plate tectonics that is driving climate change. An example might be Snowball Earth at a time when there appeared to be very widespread subduction without any known major basaltic rifting. On the other end of the scale is the end of the Paleozoic when the Siberian basalts has major rifting or attempted rifting of Siberia and leading to very strong warming, even the oceans up to hot tub temperatures of 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, three of the largest flood basalts were contemporaneous with the three largest mass extinctions. The Siberian basalts at the end of the Paleozoic, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province at the end of the Triassic, and the Deccan basalts at the end of the Mesozoic. These were times of major mass extinction, also ocean warming. Now, if we're talking about climate, we have to mention CO2. There is a correlation that we see in the last 800,000 years between CO2 and temperature. But this could be explained very clearly by the solubility of CO2 in water. You warm the ocean, more CO2 goes into the atmosphere. You cool the ocean, more CO2 goes into the ocean. And the most detailed studies show that the warming precedes the CO2 by a couple hundred years, even 400 in some cases. Anyway, solubility can explain this all. The globe has warmed at least one degree centigrade since 1970, but greenhouse warming theory appears to be mistaken. In fact, greenhouse warming theory is not even physically possible. A body of matter cannot be heated by absorbing its own radiation. A blanket of greenhouse gases can slow cooling, but cannot cause heating. If we could simply throw a blanket over hot material and end up getting new thermal energy, that would be great, but that's not the way it works. Both of these follow from the second law of thermodynamics. So I'm going to show that warming from 1970 to 1998 was caused by humans depleting the ozone layer, allowing more very hot solar ultraviolet B radiation to reach Earth. The five times faster warming from 2014 to 2016, the hottest year on record so far, was caused by the basaltic eruption of Bartholunga volcano in Iceland, the largest basaltic eruption since 1783. Now, in a short talk like this, I can't begin to address such a big change as I've just put up on the screen. There's more detail at physicallyimpossible.com. I have a booth downstairs, 733, with lots of material, and I'd love to talk to you about the details. I have a book to describe this in detail, but the point I really want to get at is that recognizing that warming is caused by ozone depletion due to basaltic lavas unlocks whole new vistas into understanding the geologic record. Now, if we look at the radiation coming from the sun, the ultraviolet radiation is the hottest, Ultraviolet C is very high energy, 
and 100% of it is absorbed in the ionosphere and in the stratosphere. It's the energy that forms the ionosphere and the stratosphere. Ultraviolet B is still high energy. About 95% of it's absorbed in the ozone layer. This is a radiation that causes sunburn, skin cancer, cataracts. It also helps our skin produce vitamin D, and that's the reason for skin color change depending on the latitude you live at. Ultraviolet A is much lower energy, 95% of it reaches Earth, only about 5% is absorbed in the ozone layer. When you have less ozone in the ozone layer, that means that less ultraviolet B is absorbed in the ozone layer, and more ultraviolet B reaches Earth. Now this shows the black line is the mean, annual mean ozone recorded in Arosa, Switzerland, about 47 degrees north, so our mid-latitudes. And you can notice that up to about 1970, the average of all of the yearly data is pretty constant. The green line shows the production of chlorofluorocarbons by humans that increased significantly in the 60s and into the 70s. And the green line going downwards is the increase in CFCs. And you can see ozone depletion follows that. The purple line up top is the temperature in this lower stratosphere. And as I said, less uh, UVB is absorbed in the ozone layer, which causes cooling that we clearly observe. And it causes warming of the oceans. The ocean heat content is the dashed red line going down through here. So 30-year increases in CFCs led to ozone depletion, which led to decreasing lower stratospheric temperature and increasing ocean heat content. Now, volcanic eruptions also led to major ozone depletion. And what's interesting is, in this case, the depletion only lasts for a few years, so only less than a decade. If you notice Mount Pinatubo, 1991 erupted, and the greatest ozone depletion we've ever observed was in 92 and 93. So what we end up with is two very distinctly different kinds of volcanoes. There's major explosive volcanic eruptions that cause net cooling, and there's major effusive basaltic flows that cause net warming. The major explosive things form aerosols in the lower stratosphere that cause reflection and dispersion of sunlight. And this is what causes the cooling of about a half a degree centigrade for two to four years. This is well observed after every major explosive eruption. Explosive eruptions are most typical above subduction zones. Following Pinatubo in the first winter, actually there was warming of three and a half degrees in much of the northern continents that was related to the ozone depletion. But then the aerosols took over and there was major cooling well observed of a half a degree centigrade uh, for almost three years. If we look at the effect of this cooling from Krakatoa in 1883, simply cooling the ocean surface for a few years, you can still see the effect in the ocean a hundred years later. So when you start having four, five, six multiple large explosive eruptions per century, you can increment the world colder and colder. And when this continues for millennia and tens of thousands of years, that's how we increment the world down into an ice age. In terms of the lava, the basaltic lava, they emit chlorine and bromine that deplete the ozone layer, but there's no aerosol to give cooling, so the net effect is warming. The large basalts that I'm talking about are most typical in aerial sub-rift zones. The climate effect is determined by the aerial extent, which depends on the duration of the eruption. Bar the Bunga in 2014 covered 85 square kilometers in six months. The Siberian Traps 251 million years ago covered 7 million square kilometers in much more than 100,000 years. So in that case, you're warming for, for a very long period of time, and the oceans were warmed up to 40 degrees centigrade, or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if we step back and look at more detailed data that's available in the ice cores in Greenland, this is now the last 125,000 years, and we're looking at the oxygen isotopes in the air bubbles, so we're looking at air temperature. And what we see are the well-known dansgaard esker uh, intervals of 25 times when there was very sudden warming within a year, within a decade for sure, followed by very slow cooling. Sudden warming, slow cooling. So the footprints of climate change 
where we have time resolution and where we can clearly get discriminate the differences show erratic sequences of rapid warming followed by slow incremental cooling over millennia. The average of these sequences is a few thousand years, but it's not cyclic. These are erratic sequences. If we look at the ocean temperatures at the same time, this is a stack of benthic sea cores. You can see very similar kind of pattern, and you can easily see the incrementing of the ocean colder and colder from 125,000 years ago to 20,000 years ago. In this case, it's smeared out because it takes many years to warm the ocean. If you have a warmer atmosphere or whatever, if you're feeding ultraviolet B into the ocean, it takes a much longer time. So when we're looking at ocean temperatures, things are smeared out. But again, uh, there's erratic sequences of sudden warming, slow cooling. In the Holocene, it turns out about every thousand years, there was a major basaltic lava flow, and associated with that was major warming. There's a lot of detail still to fill in here, but we're talking lava flows of about the size of uh, several hundred, 800 square kilometers. Craters of the moon was the Roman warm period, Elgia in Iceland was a medieval warm period, and so on. If we go back into the Eocene 50 million years ago, we find very fine layered sediments. And they seem to alternate from oil shale to trona to dolostone, to oil shale to trona to dolostone. And the people that studied this said, well, the oil shale was formed in a temperate environment like in Florida today, whereas the trona was formed in an environment of very hot, like, like Magadi in Kenya. So here we see, again, sequences that are averaging about 5,000 years but it's causing the very fine layering in the rocks, alternating between temperate and very hot. Again, the footprints of climate change where we have the data are erratic sequences of rapid warming followed by slow incremental cooling over millennia. Now this one I'm sure you can understand right away. We're looking at the Paleozoic and looking at brachiopod habitat temperatures, so that's ocean temperatures from 500 million years ago up through the Triassic 200 million years ago. And what I really want you to notice is that every sample has got a different climate, got a different temperature. It's amazing, the more samples you get, the more differences you get. There are long-term trends, as the blue curve there shows going into Ordovician Silurian Ice Age, and there are big changes in temperature. We're going from zero degrees on the left uh, to 40 degrees centigrade on the right. So climate is changing very, very rapidly, and as I showed earlier, when we're looking at where we have time detail, like in the recent ice cores, we can map this very clearly. What's interesting is that these basaltic lavas plotted on the x-axis here tend to occur at the same ages as the mass extinctions. This was pointed out by Curtilo and Wren back in 2003, and we've got a lot more data on it now. But what you see is that the Basaltic lava flows tend to occur at the end of geologic periods, ages, epochs, whatever. If we look at the geologic time scale, we can see the end of the Paleozoic was the Siberian basalts. The end of the Mesozoic was the Deccan basalts. The end of the Triassic was the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. Now, Richard Ernst has published a several inch thick book that documents over 200 of these large igneous provinces of basalt. I'm only showing 17 of the largest ones here. There are only 104 ages since the Cambrian. I would argue that the majority of these sudden changes in the geologic record will ultimately be traced back to large basaltic lava flows, ones covering hundreds all the way up to millions of square kilometers. There's a lot of work to be done. Also, there's an association with glaciation at several of these boundaries. There's a lot to be worked out but the data are there for us to look at. So the balance of effusive explosive volcanism due to plate tectonics explains very clearly the change in detail that we see. And finally, I just want to say that oxygen isotope measurements are a real blessing because just for foraminifera, there are 10,000 living species, 40,000 fossil species. Each of these uh, relate to a particular environment, a particular time. These are usually less than a millimeter in size, so they're sand grains. They can be gotten out of a well. Uh, they can be gotten out of field crops. And the individual critters only last for weeks to years. So the oxygen isotope on one critter tells us the temperature over a very short period of time at some time way back in the Paleozoic. 
so we got the detail. And we know the changes uh, in oxygen isotopes uh, long term, but we've got a lot of fine detail we can get from that. And the data here are for the taking. So in summary, volcanoes rule climate change, plate tectonics rules volcanoes, and these are very exciting times to be a geoscientist as we move forward plate tectonics to the next level of detail where we can actually determine the climate in much greater precision than, for example, we've determined the magnetic field. Thank you.